In this presentation, I will discuss the role of radiological imaging in detection and evaluation of dental caries. Through the presentation, I will refer to the ADA caries classification system, so familiarity with this document will be helpful to better understand the content of this presentation. I will start by applying some basic principles of imaging to understanding the radiographic appearance of caries and the inherent limitations of radiological imaging in caries detection. And finally, we will apply this knowledge into the clinical context of screening our patients for caries and systematically evaluating the radiographs to detect caries. Most of the material in this presentation is drawn from my textbook and from the manuscript by the ADA Council of Scientific Affairs. So let's start by defining a caries lesion. What we evaluate clinically or radiographically as a caries lesion is a consequence of imbalance in the demineralization and remineralization over time resulting in a net mineral loss. And it's this net mineral loss that makes caries visible on radiographs. Radiographic contrast between tissues is based on their mineralization. Dental tissues such as enamel and dentin are highly mineralized and appear markedly radiopaque. When caries occurs, it causes loss of mineral content and thus makes the lesion appear radiolucent relative to the surrounding enamel and dentin. Detection of this radiolucency, that is a change in the radio density of the enamel and or dentin, is what we will identify as caries. So a quick review of the categorization of caries depending on the tooth surface site. Pit and fissure caries occur in the pits and fissures of teeth predominantly in the occlusal surfaces, on the buccal and lingual surfaces of the posterior teeth, and in the lingual pits of the maxillary incisors and canines. Approximal caries occurs on a tooth surface that is immediately adjacent to a contact point. Cervical and smooth surface caries occurs on the cervical regions of teeth and on any smooth surfaces of teeth that is not adjacent to a contact point. And root caries refers to caries occurring on the surfaces of the root apical to the cemento-enamel junction. Next, let's review the ADA caries classification system that categorizes caries as initial, moderate, and advanced according to the stage of progression. The initial caries lesion is non-cavitated and involves the enamel and the outer third of dentin. Importantly, up to 50% of such lesions could have involved the dentin, emphasizing the need of imaging to provide information that cannot be clinically determined. In moderate caries, you have early cavitation, and in advanced caries, you have late cavitation that extends through the enamel and dentin. In both these situations, imaging provides us an assessment of the depth of the caries lesion. There are established schemes to score caries lesions on radiographs. E1 and E2 refer to caries that is in the outer and inner halves of enamel respectively. And when caries extends into the dentin, it's scored as D1, D2 and D3 depending on whether it involves the outer, middle or inner third of dentin. So when viewing radiographs, our task is not simply to detect the presence of a caries lesion but also to assess the depth of its extension. And that places into context the role of imaging. It may provide the initial detection of a caries lesion that is not clinically apparent. And in other cases, it provides information on the lesion depth and extent, both of which are factors that are important in management of caries. So how good are radiographs for caries diagnosis? Do they provide any information beyond the clinical examination? And how can we increase our accuracy for detection of caries? Remember that the bite-wing radiograph, just like any other diagnostic test, is not always correct. What we identify as caries on the radiograph may truly represent caries or may represent sound enamel and dentin that we incorrectly called as caries. Likewise, what we identify as absence of caries may be truly sound tooth structure or may be a caries lesion that we have not been able to detect on the radiograph. There are two measures of diagnostic efficacy. The first is sensitivity or the true positive ratio. It tells us how good our test is to correctly identify diseased patients. 
A test with a high sensitivity has a high true positive ratio. A test with a low sensitivity has a very high number of false negative results. The next is specificity which measures the ability of a test to correctly identify absence of a disease. A test which has a high specificity has high numbers of true negative results. So let's look at the data on these measures for caries detection. Note that the performance of imaging varies depending on the site at which caries occurs. In general, radiographs have low sensitivity in detecting caries on the proximal surfaces of teeth. The sensitivity increases with involvement of dentin and with the cavitation of the lesion. That is, the sensitivity increases with advanced stage of the disease. The specificity, however, is relatively high and ranges from 94 to 98%. The sensitivity for detecting pit and fissure caries occurring on the occlusal surfaces of teeth is somewhat higher and similar to the lesions on the proximal surface, the sensitivity increases as the depth of the lesion increases. So to summarize the key points from this data, radiological imaging has a low sensitivity for detection of caries. That sensitivity varies with the lesion site and depth. Our accuracy for detecting small proximal lesions is low and our accuracy for detecting caries increases as the depth of the lesion increases. So from a practical context, the low sensitivity and the high specificity of our imaging procedures means that we are very highly likely to get false negatives. So when it comes to radiographic caries detection, why do we have so many false negatives? The first reason is an inherent limitation of radiography. In order for radiographic contrast to be perceptible, you need to have adequate demineralization. And unless you have 30 to 40 percent demineralization, it does not appear radiolucent. In an initial caries lesion, the amount of demineralization may be less than this, and thus these lesions will not be radiographically apparent. The second reason is related to the two dimensional nature of radiography. Due to superimposition of tooth structure, it can mask caries lesions and thus hinder our detection. To better comprehend the limitations of two-dimensional imaging, let's compare a two-dimensional image with the slices from a CT scan. Note that the extent of the lesion and the loss of tooth structure are underestimated on the two-dimensional image relative to the CT scan. So how does imaging fit into caries detection? Most importantly, the information from imaging should supplement your clinical information and is not a substitute for a thorough clinical information. When your clinical examination does not identify any cavitated lesions, imaging could help detect subsurface demineralization. And in the presence of frank cavitation, imaging allows us to assess the depth into dentition, the proximity of the caries to the pulp, and an overall assessment of the restorability of the tooth. Next, let's start to make these radiological assessments and remember to evaluate both the periapical and bite-wing radiographs. When performing the radiological analyses, it's good to have a systematic approach. Remember to evaluate each interproximal surface and each occlusal surface individually. Follow the stepwise approach. Outline the dentoenamel junction. Evaluate the radio density of enamel. It should be continuous and uniformly radio dense and more radio opaque than dentin. Evaluate the radio density of dentin and look for areas of radiolucency, especially immediately below the DEJ. Remember that the tooth surface may be imaged on more than one radiograph, so confirm your findings on the multiple images. Radiographic appearances of caries have some uniqueness depending on their site of origin. On proximal surfaces, the lesions occur between the contact point and the gingival margin. The classical appearance of a proximal surface lesion is a triangle with its base on the tooth surface and its apex at the DEJ. Other appearances include band or notch-like radiolucencies extending through the enamel. All of these appearances can be detected by careful evaluation of the radio density of enamel. When the caries initially penetrates the dentin, it tends to spread along the dentinoenamel junction, 
so make sure that you closely evaluate the radio density of the dentin adjacent to the DEJ. As the lesion extends into dentin, it forms another triangular radiolucency with its base at the DEJ and with the apex pointed towards the pulp horns. Eventually, as the lesion extends further into dentin, it becomes more amorphous in shape. Here is an example assessment of interproximal caries assessment. On the mesial surface of the second molar, we see a triangular radiolucency that extends into the inner half of enamel. Note that the dentin adjacent to the GEJ is somewhat radiolucent, although not overtly so. However, remember that radiographs, by their inherent nature, tend to underestimate the depth of the lesion. On the distal surface of the first molar is a lesion extending into the outer third of dentin. And we see two enamel lesions on the interproximal surfaces between the second premolar and the first molar. Practically, you may need to adjust the density and contrast of your image to better appreciate those radiolucent areas. In this example, we see caries extending into the dentin to various depths. Note that all of the dentinal lesions have a tendency to spread along the DEJ, emphasizing the need for us to carefully evaluate this region when we are evaluating for caries. Next, let's consider the imaging appearances of Pitt and Fisher caries. Radiographs have a low sensitivity for detecting initial caries lesions that occur in the pits and fissures, and this is due to the amount of superimposing structure from the buccal and lingual surfaces. So we're unlikely to detect occlusal caries that is limited to the enamel. As the caries reaches the dentin, it spreads along the dentino-enamel junction and assumes a triangular or a semicircular shape. In this example, you see a semicircular radiolucency that extends into the inner third of dentin. If you follow the radio density of enamel along the occlusal surface, you can appreciate a sharp interruption in the outline. However, superimposition from the tooth structure may mimic an intact tooth structure. Also note the multiple proximal surface carious lesions in most of the other teeth. These radiographs show you occlusal caries with varying extent into dentin. In almost all of the radiographs, you will note that the disruption of the enamel is barely perceptible. This emphasizes the need for us to critically evaluate the radio density of dentin adjacent to the occlusal surface when evaluating for occlusal caries. Next, consider caries that occurs in the pits and fissures on the buccal and lingual surfaces of teeth. Due to superimposition, these caries lesions may mimic occlusal caries lesions on radiographs. Correlation of your radiographic findings with the clinical information will help you make this distinction. This example demonstrates buccal caries that is superimposed over a proximal caries lesion. Remember that on the radiograph alone, you will not be able to determine the buccal or lingual nature of the radiolucency. However, that information is accessible to you clinically. Root caries occurs on the tooth surface below the CEJ. Most root caries are clinically detectable, so our diagnostic task when imaging root caries is not to detect the caries but rather to determine the extent of the lesion and its proximity to the pulp. These examples demonstrate root surface caries. Note that the origin of the radiolucency appears to be at or below the CEJ, although the radiolucency extends into the coronal dentin. When assessing for root caries, remember to distinguish between root caries and cervical burnout. Unlike root caries, cervical burnout is more diffuse and does not have a distinct outline. And finally, radiographs play an important role in assessing recurrent caries that occurs below restorations. Most dental restorative material is radiopaque and this allows us to detect the radiolucent caries that occurs under the restoration. Also remember that the radiographic appearances of erosion or a lingual concavity or enamel hypoplasia mimic caries. And remember that in almost all digital imaging programs you can manually adjust the density and contrast. This is extremely helpful to appreciate the changes caused by caries. Developing a systematic approach to caries diagnosis, think biologically and follow the pattern of the disease. Identify the lesion. Determine its extent into enamel and dentin. Assess the amount of tooth structure that has been undermined. 
as the Caries approximated the pulp. And beyond the Caries lesion, think of its consequences of pulpal and periapical inflammation. Periapical inflammation will be manifested on radiographs as widening of the periodontal ligament or a periapical radiolucency. So assessment of the periapical region should follow every caries assessment that you do.